Barbara? Hey. Hey. Hey, babe. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick call. I know you're supposed to meet my parents tonight, and uh, you're pretty stressed out about it. Well, I, I did some talking with the project managers at work. We did a little whiteboarding, and uh, I came up with a list of things for you, uh, the do's and don'ts with them, uh, mostly don'ts. So I just wanted to go over that with you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So, well, here's the list. Uh, so no politics. Don't talk about Barack Obama, Justin Trudeau, or Vladimir Putin. Don't talk about basketball, hockey, football, cricket or shuffleboard. Don't talk about cars, trucks, or EVs. Don't talk about female wage gaps, slavery, LGBT, or religion. Don't talk about weather or anything about yourself. So basically you don't want me to have personality? Hey, you said it, I didn't. Welcome to the 2018 Volkswagen Tiguan review. Now this is mostly a US spec vehicle and they've stretched out this global architecture to the max to give people a pseudo three row crossover. Now you looked at the exterior and one of the most interesting parts about it is of course this orange paint job because other than that it literally has basically no personality and that transfers right to the interior space of this vehicle. So let's get started with that. Now, like most vehicles, there's good and bad. So we're gonna, we're gonna start with the pros and cons list. We're gonna start with the positives first. The biggest one is the amount of space and room to grow, namely in the first and second row of this vehicle. You never feel cramped. You always feel like there's hip room, leg room, shoulder room, head room. And if that's a big thing for you, if, especially if you're a bigger person, I think you're gonna be really comfortable in these front seats. The second biggest pro is the level of simplicity on the interior space here. There is almost zero gimmicks in terms of how the buttons and the switches, the light switches, the steering wheel controls are absolutely and positively some of the easiest to use. Your turn signals click when you put it into place. There's no like vagueness anywhere. Your HVAC controls are some of the best you're gonna find in a car. They are completely separate from the infotainment. You don't even, you, the infotainment can break in five years and you can still use your HVAC controls. Rotary knobs, easily visible it tells you your temperature that you're selecting just a really nice layout the shifter is not a digital shifter it clicks into place there are detents every time you switch gear which is nice in a car like this because so many vehicles are getting away from that again almost every knob and switch in this car has positive feedback you know exactly what is happening when you're using it the next biggest pro is the level of fit and finish. And when I mean fit and finish, everything fits together really well in here. There's no weird gaps or quality issues. It feels solid to me and very durable. I mean, you look at some of these plastics, you know you could literally beat the crap out of this and yeah, you're gonna scratch it up, but it just feels more like a utilitarian vehicle than anything. On to the last biggest pro of the Tiguan, namely with this trim level. And this is something where so many vehicles just kind of shit the bed, to be honest. The technology works in here. And the reason it works is because your safety systems are not totally intrusive. They don't annoy the hell out of you. Your blind spot monitoring works. Your rear view camera works. You don't have to go into a 
20 different menus to adjust this, that, or all the sensitivity. You get in here, you drive it, and you don't think about it. That's when technology is at its best. The second part is infotainment. And the new generation or the second generation infotainment in VW cars, specifically this one, is really good. This uses the, the maximum size screen they have in these cars at eight inches. And this uses an IPS LCD panel. And the benefit of that is great viewing angles, the black levels are really good, the resolution's really good, and the black levels look great at night. Now, it's not you know, to the level of OLED, but it's still really good for in-car screen technology. Now, the whole face of this is capacitive, which means the entire screen's touch sensitive, much like your smartphone. There's no physical buttons except the volume knob and your tuning knob. And the big complaint is these knobs are way too small. And my, I don't have big hands and they are totally petite. And the main reason why they don't use bigger knobs is because of the way that they've designed the front panel of this. They didn't give themselves enough room from the buttons above and below the knobs to make them bigger. If you put a bigger knob in, you're constantly going to accidentally touch the buttons above and below the knobs. So you're stuck with this. It's poor design and they could easily readjust this. There's so much bezel space on here to do it. I love the way that they did the graphical user interface where it's all black and they only light up and only use colors where they need to for menu items or text items. And that's really good at night because it's not overly bright. Never do, do I think, oh, I have to turn the screen off because I'm blinded by it. Just the utilization of the menu structure, getting in and out of things, it's fast. Getting in and out of the car, like as soon as I hit the start button, my USB sticks playing music. My phone connects right away. And there are some bugs, like I lost the volume of my Bluetooth device when I was in here. The volume knob no longer worked. I had to unpair and repair my phone even after resetting the head unit, it didn't work. Uh, your voice search is kind of flaky, but mostly all your menu structure is extremely fast, super intuitive to use, and it supports lossless audio like FLAC, playback from your USB stick, and Android Auto and Apple CarPlay if you're into that. It, so it's like one of the most functional systems out there great interface, great speed, mostly usable. Um, and it's a good thing for a car in this price range. So I think you're going to like it. Now it's time to get onto the negatives. And if you're somebody that's not in and out of a lot of cars, you get into this for the first time, you might be okay with it. Or if you're a VW fanatic, my biggest issue with it is it is so generic on the inside of this. It feels so plain Jane, so boring, so devoid of any type of flair or interior styling. I'm talking about aesthetic styling. There's none of that here. And that's why I said it feels so institutional. It feels like a corporate designed interior. They went on a whiteboard and they decided, well, how can we not offend anybody? How can we make the least offensive product possible? And this is the byproduct. And I'm gonna tell you something. I don't care if the car's 10,000, 30,000, or 100,000. You wanna get out of it and think about how I really enjoyed that. You wanna look back at it and feel something. And that's not what you feel on the interior space of this Tiguan. And it's not that there's anything particularly wrong with it. There's just nothing particularly exciting or right about it. All right. <sighs> Now that I got that off my chest, it's time to talk about the next negative part about this vehicle, specifically this trim. The seat design. They feel extremely flat to me. Um, and it doesn't help that this has this leatherette seating surface on this trim level. And VW calls it VTEX. And to me, it again, it feels like an industrial application, something that you would find in public transportation, a train, a cab seat. Uh, and I just don't like the way that they feel. Now, the other part is you know that they designed this to try to be compatible with most body types. So I think that's a, that's a pro because if you're bigger or you're smaller, you're still gonna fit. And the back seats are the same way, but they're way more flat. I, I mean, despite it reclining and you can move the whole bench forward and back, it just feels very stiff overall. Now switching gears a little bit, the back, the second row has extremely good capacity 
There is a lot of legroom back here. There's a lot of room to move around. And this is one of the biggest pros of this car is the front occupancy space and the second row. But here's where the negative part comes in. With the all wheel drive version like this car or SUV, you can opt for a th third row of seats. It's optional for $500. And I'll be totally straight. They should be paying you $500 to get in the back of this thing. This, the, the front wheel drive version, the third row comes standard. I would absolutely not opt for this. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to check a box and say, hey, we have a third row, but I don't know who the hell is gonna get back there, why you would get back there. I wouldn't even put a prison inmate in this back seat, let alone my kid. It is just a joke. So luckily, the third row is optional on the all-wheel drive version, and if you don't choose it, you get a lot more space. This has an electronic lift gate, which is really quick. If you get the upper trim level, this will close automatically when you walk away from it, or it will open when you put your foot under it. This does not, which is good. Less sensors, less electronics. The third row back seats go down really easy, and this is one of the best parts of the operation of this, and that's where we're gonna close this out on a pro. These go down with solid mechanical controls. The straps, the pull it back up, feel like they're gonna last the life of the car. None of this, none of the operation of this feels cheap, chintzy at all, and that's a big pro to this. The levers to pull down the second row, again, really solid. Uh, they spring down extremely well, assuming that the front seats aren't blocking or I don't have crap in the back, but using this for utility is great. There's a spare underneath here. I mean, you're really gonna get your money's worth out of this aspect of the Tiguan. Now that we have the interior and exterior out of the way, let's head to the shop and look at the mechanical aspect of this Tiguan. I've just put this American VW Tiguan on the Ben Pack lift. And I was somewhat interested to take a look at this because they've elongated it so much. This is Volkswagen's MQB platform. And what that means is it's a modular architecture. The substructure or chassis is basically a giant Lego. They can transform different sections of this to build different cars. And when I say different cars, I'm talking about millions of different cars from Audi, Skoda, Volkswagen, obviously, more and more. So what you're looking at underneath is just a larger version of a Volkswagen Golf. And the main reason they do this is because it cuts down on so many different costs of engineering. It cuts down on the cost to redevelop crash structures. Um, different suspension. They have hard mounting points all throughout this. So in the assembly process, they can easily put different cars in the assembly line process and they are all fit certain points. So, you know, you could take this section, swap it onto a different car and they're essentially all the same. And this is why Volkswagen with this architecture, it's so profitable for them. So what does that mean? As a consumer, you take a look at this and for the most part, it looks like a lot of other cars that we look at. Stamp steel lower control arms, stamp steel subframe. You have an aluminum knuckle design. It's a strut-based front suspension. Now the rest of the front end, you can tell it's pretty wide open. And I gotta tell you, there's two pros to this. One is you can get at everything extremely easy. That you don't have to take a ton of panels off to get at things. There's a little bit that you can look up, you can check for leaks. It's just kind of an easier car to service because you remove it. Now it does have aero panels on the left and right to help flow air towards the back, so it's not completely devoid of that. The other thing that you notice up front is VW's updated two liter turbo has a cast iron block, which is not something you typically see, but it does have a forged crankshaft in there. So that's something that you can tell under here. When you get to the back of the Tiguan, there's some Captain Obvious things here I'm gonna point out. Both your lower control arms are stamped steel. Your trailing arm is stamped steel, but it's all connected to an aluminum knuckle. Now, honestly, this looks like pretty much every other manufacturer's multi-link design. There's just a lot more space here, and that's because VW has elongated the wheelbase so much. There's a lot of a room to work with back here. Now, 
with some of the airflow they have tried to direct the air from the plastic panels over the tank and then back to this muffler which is a low profile design that acts more like a diffuser but the weirdest thing about this is i haven't seen this on any other cars recently is the exhaust outlets just blow to the ground and the exhaust finishers in the bumper are straight up fake there's not even holes in it it's just really cheesy i know most people aren't going to notice it but it's it's one of those things that's so generic about this now the last thing to talk about while i'm still up in the rear end of the vw is this has the all-wheel drive option. And whether you choose the front-wheel drive version or the all-wheel drive version, you can still tow 1,500 pounds. But honestly, if you're gonna buy a vehicle like this, just get the all-wheel drive, unless you're in perfect weather all the time. It just makes so much sense. Now, VW uses the Borg Warner Haldex rear differential for the all-wheel drive setup, of course. And this uses an electro-hydraulic multi-plate clutch system. There is an electric pump that constantly is pressurizing its fluid. And this fluid can help that multi-plate clutch system basically clamp and unclamp, slip and unslip. And the benefit of this is it stays cooler, it's extremely accurate, and it's very fast to respond. It can always keep the power going where it's needed. And because they make a kajillion of these, it's pretty reliable. The last thing to talk about in the shop is under the hood. And I am looking at VW Group's global 2-liter turbocharged direct-injected engine. And this is, of course, designed around being fuel efficient and efficient in general. And this has been updated. Now, in the Tiguan, this is the only motor option you have. And with the horsepower and torque that it puts out, it's barely adequate. And it's one of the most underwhelming parts of driving this vehicle. Now, if you had another engine option, maybe it wouldn't be as big of an issue. But... You know, you're going to have to drive this and see if you can deal with it. It is mated to a 8-speed Azen torque converted automatic transmission that is made in Japan. This car carries a 3-VIN, which means it is made in Mexico. The engine is made in Mexico. The Haldex unit in the back is made in Germany, but various other parts of this car are mostly made in Mexico as well. Now, as we look around the engine bay, it is it does have a ton of room to service. You still have an engine oil dipstick. You have your oil filter at the top. So doing basic service is going to be pretty simple uh, with the exception of your direct injection carbon buildup that you're going to have to do maintenance on on this, uh, you know, probably every 30 to 60,000 miles. But that aside, let's get this thing on the road and see how it drives. It's time to take a ride in the all new American Tiguan. And for the most of the people that are gonna drive this, they're looking for a family vehicle, something comfortable, something that is usable, practical, and isn't gonna cause a lot of drama. So here it goes. The ride quality of this vehicle is extremely soft. It's on the softer side. When you're cruising around, there's almost never a time where you're like, man, this thing rides rough. And it's one of the best parts of driving it. Now, at the same time, you know, it, it handles bumps, it handles broken pavement extremely well, but it's one of these vehicles that I feel is more under dampened. And what do I mean by that? When I got on the expressway and got in higher speed, 75, 80 mile, 85 miles an hour, you start to feel this, the, the rebound in the shocks, not being able to keep up. And what you get is this more springboard effect, this more like undampened feel. And you feel it through the floorboards, you feel it through the steering wheel, and it's this vibration that travels through your body. Now, if you're staying under like 75, like you are on most highways, you're probably never gonna notice this. And I really appreciate the softer ride that this car has. And you know, <laughs> there's like a lot of sporty SUVs that don't make very much sense. They don't handle particularly well and the suspension's way too rough. This is not one of those cars. 
Now, one of the biggest questions is performance because let's face it, you know, this is a big vehicle. You want to know that you can kind of get off the line, merge into traffic. And I think this is where it kind of gets a little dicey because this two liter four cylinder doesn't have a lot of oomph. With the stop start activated, which shuts off the engine to save fuel, when you need to get going, hammer it. There's this delay to get going, and a lot of it is the initial buildup of the turbo with the boost. Some of it is the way that this automatic transmission's programmed. And at first, when I got into it, I'm like, I could have swore it was a dual clutch because there's some like strange hesitation with the way that the torque converter is programmed, and it doesn't have the smoothest actuation all the time. Now, if we come to a stop here and kind of see how it gets off the line, it does have a few different drive modes. It has sport, eco, and normal, and honestly, I always leave it in normal. Just changing these settings don't do much. Sport will let the transmission behave more aggressively. It will hold revs but you don't really have good manual control over it. So that's why I just leave it in normal. Uh, and aside from some of the initial hesitation, when you're getting off the line, the transmission behavior is pretty good overall. So let's take this from a stop in sport mode and just hit the gas pedal. Start stop is deactivated now, let's go. You really don't notice it, when I first got into this car, I really didn't notice that it was turbocharged. It feels very naturally aspirated to me, very progressive. The only time you really notice it, it's a turbo car is from that initial start off. From the rest of the time, it's really, aside from its sound, it's just like a regular four-cylinder car. So I'm going to try accelerating again from a stop. Now I'm going to brake torque it, which brings up the RPMs to see if it gets rid of some of that lag from the start. Not really. So I think the best thing to do is if you drive this, leave it in normal mode, leave it in fully automatic. And you know, if you really have to get off the line quickly in a tight situation, just make sure your stop start is off. It, it, the car will just be a lot more responsive. Now let's get this thing going again and talk about another major factor of driving this. That is sound insulation how much the outside environment affects your driving. Tire noise, road noise, wind noise, and this does a pretty good job, namely for the price point. At, you know, obviously this is spec'd out more closer to 32 to $44,000. It's about on average what you would expect. Now, in terms of tire noise, I don't hear much. The wind noise from the front windshield isn't bad. Um, and overall, the build quality is pretty good, again, for the price point. Now, it's not completely like the best, I mean, I do feel when you hear creaks and rattles, like if you get over rougher pavement, you do hear little bits and pieces rattling in here. And it's not like a constant rattle, it's only over big bumps. So again, it's just something that a lot of people that buy these types of vehicles are concerned about. Now I've talked about the underbody, the interior, the driving segment. Let's get on to the final thoughts about this Tiguan. Final thoughts on the VW Tiguan. When I look at these vehicles, SUVs and CUVs, I try to think of it from a perspective of, if I'm going to part with 30 to $35,000, I have a high level of expectations. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there are so many choices. There are some really exceptional vehicles in this segment. When I got into this, I realized this is average. And I think it's average by design. There's not anything that stands out is completely negative, and there's nothing that stands out is just blow you away. Now, the things that are extremely positive about it are somewhat of the underpinnings. This is a global vehicle for them, global platform, a motor that has been utilized extensively. So if you're going to keep this long term, there are going to be a ton of parts available for it. And the know-how on how to repair and fix things, it's more on the simple side because there's going to be millions of the underpinnings of this on the road. So that's a huge pro. 
The second biggest thing is the level of simplicity on the interior. There's nothing that's going to confuse you. There's not a lot that's going to be annoying to utilize every day, and that's why you would choose this. But the reason why you wouldn't choose it is it has a cardboard personality. The interior is so generic, and overall, there's just too much here that makes you feel kind of blah driving and looking at it. Now, if you're not about style, you don't care about that, you're probably gonna be really happy with this. And with an optional third row that's pretty much unusable, it kind of throws these little bones at you to say, hey, look at me and buy me. Take a look at it yourself and make your own decision. Take care, see you next time. Don't wear anything with too much color and definitely don't crimp your hair. Don't talk about femi lifts, makeup or fashion. Don't talk about education, the internet, social media or movies. Don't talk about organic foods, fast food or salad. Don't talk about urban sprawl, rural areas or city. And don't talk about movies, music, streaming media. And don't talk about weather or anything about yourself.